Let's hold our questions until the uh, panel discussion uh, in the interest of time and also to discuss it all together. So let me now introduce uh, Charles Hugh Jones, who's going to, uh, uh, who is the Vice President of Medical Affairs North America at Sanofi, and he's going to speak about the Data Sphere Project. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here today. So as I said, I work at Sanofi. That's my day job. Uh, for my evening job, I work for an organization called CEO Roundtable on Cancer um, as part of their Life Sciences Consortium. And I just want to spend 10 minutes now speaking to you about Project Datasphere, which you'll see is an initiative to uh, quite boldly make data sharing happening, both at the academic and the commercial side within uh, cancer research. And it's cancer research specifically because there are some very good reasons why we should be doing it there. So let me just start for a second with this by telling you about the CEO Roundtable because it's an important organization. It's important in helping make data sharing happening. It's a group of CEOs of the largest com companies in the world and some of the smallest companies as well who look for ways of reducing cancer in the workplace, stopping smoking, health, uh, exercise, and so on. But at the same time, we take groups of people within those organizations, the heads of R&D, medical affairs, and so on, as a life sciences consortium to work on specific projects. And you'll see here, there's Covance, there's Duke, uh, there's GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, and so on. And it's done under the, the safe harbor of the Institute of Medicine, the NCI, and the FDA. And what's critical is those FDAs, uh, sorry, those uh, CEOs are able to help us make the decisions that sometimes don't happen in organizations about can we safely let data go. So I want to talk about three things. We've got 10 minutes. Um, the problem of oncology, data sharing, and Project Datasphere. I've got about nine minutes left, so I feel a little bit like President Obama last night, who took five seconds and turned it into a whole policy debate. I don't know if you saw that. Um, so we'll, we'll rush through this. Um, so uh, I'm only going to give you one slide on the problem with oncology. Our colleagues in cardiovascular medicine have done an extraordinary job over the last 30 years. And you see here the mortality rate per 100,000 population for patients with cardiovascular disease has more than halved. Everything from beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and so on. If you look at the same data for cancer over the last 30 years, you see it's a radically different picture. And you'll see that there is a slight delta around 1991. It starts to track downhill. But the vast majority of that is from changes in smoking habit and changes in screening like colonoscopy, uh, PSA, and so on. And only a relatively small uh, part of that is due to therapeutics. That's not to say there hasn't been huge and very effective progress in the cancer marketplace, but we're just not being as effective as we would like to be. And at the same time, the cost of cancer drugs over the last 30 years has skyrocketed. And we all know the problems we've got with healthcare. We talked about this in the debate last night. Um, this is an unsustainable situation where we're paying in excess of often $100,000 for a cancer treatment. We need to find better ways of doing it. One of the solutions of many that we need to address is data sharing. So this project is specifically about how do we make data sharing happen within oncology. I think I'm preaching to the choir. Everyone here obviously believes that data sharing is something that's particularly important. We wouldn't be here otherwise. I think the single biggest driver should be the fact that 7.6 million people die every year with cancer. And uh, there's someone, or every one of us knows someone who's been touched by cancer. But then there are the more prosaic reasons, faster, more efficient research. Certainly in cancer, we're getting much better at subtyping individuals who are getting different types of cancer and turning what were formerly large cancer groupings into much smaller disease areas. One of the problems you have with that is you start getting fewer and fewer patients, and that's important from a statistical methodology point of view. And then there are th issues related to transparency, real-world data, unknowns, and so on. So everyone's on board. The JCO says we should be doing it. Uh, Peggy Hamburg at the FDA says we're doing it. There's vast qualities, quantities of unused data, and yet no one is sharing that data. So what is Project Datasphere? Well, the fact is the need exists, so why won't they do it? And this is what we looked at, first of all. What are the problems to making data share happen? And there are obviously unique challenges in healthcare, privacy, and so on. But the attitude seems to be, and I'm quoting Andrew here, that don't share unless I can prove that no harm occurs. And we need to turn that round. 
There are academic disincentives. The whole tenure system within universities is based around not sharing your data, keeping it as close to your chest as possible so you can publish. From a patient point of view, you're concerned about privacy and ethics. At a corporate level, IP. And then everyone actually has problems with what are the resources needed to actually do the data sharing. It does take time. So we then said, well, what would great look like? And in my idea, a great data sharing would be a library where you could go into a room on lots of shelves, as it were, metaphorically. Um, this is electronic. Um, but you could go to different shelves and say, I want to take down the books on this type of breast cancer or maybe for a particular pathway, let's say PARP inhibitors. And you can take the data set plus the, the blank CRF, so you know how the data was collected, plus the, uh, the, any other documents like the protocol, and take them into a working room in the library and then start to merge the data around. That would be my ideal situation. So we tried to work on this idea and see how we could make it happen. So the first thing, it needs to be simple. It needs to be the iTunes, it needs to be the iStore of how do you do data sharing. It's, it's far too complicated at the moment, and I think that creates a barrier. You need to have systematic sharing. Um, and for us, the single biggest goal at the beginning is getting access in the data. I'm 100% on board with data standards. I'm working very closely with Becky Cush at CDISC. But first of all, we need to get the data out there. So what we're proposing here is initially we're going to put comparator arms, and I put a little a caveat there because I'm really working towards getting active arms and genomic data. The protocols, the blank CRFs, and the data descriptors so you know how this data was collected. Collecting data from industry and academia, positive and negative studies, they're all good. It's all good data. A negative study often tells us much from an epidemiological point of view um, as a positive study and put it into a publicly accessible, and again, publicly we can debate here, I'm as, I'm my principle is for open as possible, in a simple web library that respects the privacy issues. And then use the convening power of CEOs together with patients and advocacy groups, and this is where communication is gonna be one of the single biggest things we have to do to make this happen, to, make, to, to drive uh, academia and industry to share their data. And then share it in a standardized de-identification way. So when people come to me and say, how do I do it? I can give it to them in a bundle and say, this is how you de-identify your data. If you do it this way, you'll be fine. Um, and then work with third-party data, data aggregators um, who can then take the data that we've got. They can take books off the shelves, take them to the tables in the library and start working together. I'm not going to have any judgment call. We as a team are not going to make any judgment call about how you should use this data, what you're going to do with it. Our job is to provide the data. And the reason for that is critical within oncology is there have been some very successful applications of aggregating data. For example, in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, the problem we have with oncology is there's something like 800 drugs being developed, about 9,000 studies in clinicaltrials.gov. The reality of us being able to aggregate all those data sets ourselves is impossible. So what we need to use, do is use the crowd, use the, the crowdsourcing approach to aggregating this data. And so that's how we came up with what is the data sphere. So we need to make it easy to do. So we asked three questions. Why would people even want to share their data? The second question is, how would I do it? So if I was prepared to share my data, how would I do it? And once I've prepared my data and made it relatively easy to, uh, to, to post, where would I put it? So we've set about creating or defining the incentives for donors related to productivity, and we've built a model in terms of potential cost savings, demonstrating that you can get increased citation from the sharing your data, and then potentially actually getting a DOI number attached to your data, so FDA can then use it as part of their, of their regulatory, um, regulatory aspects. Um, persuade donors that there's a real benefit to collaboration, and then start to look at ways of uh, micro-attribution. And we're taking some uh, software that's been used in the insurance industry for doing attribution between different insurance companies and seeing if we can turn that towards uh, attributing folks in the, uh, the science realm. At the same time, we have to incentivize patients, and that's again all about communications, how to define that we're using their data and we're using it safely. And then I don't think we have to incentivize the researchers as much. If we provide them the data, I'm sure they'll get on with it. But I've had some great discussions with uh, companies like Kaggle where you can actually do, run data competitions. I love their, their strap line. It's making data science a sport. Um, then there's the how. So it's coming up with tools. We're creating standard de-identification, working with um, the uh, Vanderbilt University. A single data use agreement that everyone agrees to. And you, again, you can fill that in online. 
Um, and then the resources in terms of how-to guides, a sort of service guide for doing your de-identification, forums and so on, and then tools for advocacy. And then lastly, we're working very closely with the, the, the database company, SAS, and they've been incredibly helpful doing this work pro bono for the CEO roundtable on cancer to produce a secure, simple, powerful, scalable uh, website where fundamentally everything you need to do to share data is automated. Everything from signing up to access the data to downloading it or uploading your data, data use agreements, and so on. So I'm going to finish off by showing you this is the, f the first uh, iteration of the database. I spent uh, a couple of hours on the phone with SAS yesterday looking at the, uh, the incredible work they've done generating the database. Um, all sorts of tools uh, tucked away in About Us, contributing data, guides for use, and then really educational tools for the public and companies about sharing data. So here you'll see some of the aspects. And then finally, what we're going to do from Sanofi is we're going to donate two recent uh, phase three clinical studies, uh, one for a drug called cabazitaxel, which was approved a couple of years ago, and then a second data for a, a failed drug called aniparib, which was uh, allegedly a PARP inhibitor for triple negative breast cancer. Um, we've de-identified those data sets, and we're using those as primer data sets to go in the database. And the goal is to have at least 30 high quality, and these are really high quality company collected, CRO collected data sets in the database by the end of the year, by the end of, sorry, end of 2013, and then expand beyond that. So just one quick word on our, our de-identification. We've used a modified safe harbor de-identification approach with Vanderbilt University. Um, we're slightly less restrictive in some areas, slightly more restrictive in other areas, but the, the general approach demonstrates that we've got 0.00029% of the US population is unique. That makes us 100 times safer than the safe harbor approach, and I think that's a reasonably comfortable approach for going forward for the type of de-identification while still keeping it useful. We're keeping dates in for the oncology research, which is obviously critical, but at the same time, we're making it sufficiently um, de-identified in terms of HIPAA. So we're working with a huge number of partners, and I really want to thank everyone that's up on this slide. Um, advocacy and the social media is going to be a critical part to driving this. I truly believe this has to be driven by patients in collaboration with academia and companies to do it together. And I think with the sort of environment we've demonstrated here, it's something that can be successful. So I'm going to stop there. I, this is the plan for the next five years, which you can see later on. The critique is we've still got lots of stuff to do in terms of uh, microattribution, how we handle genomic data and so on. Certainly at Sanofi Oncology, we're committed to putting all the data out on the web. We're starting with these two data sets. We're going to move forward rapidly with additional data sets. So finally, just to acknowledge the various uh, members of the team who've been working on this project, it's not just Sanofi, it's Pfizer, it's Celgene, it's SAS, um, it's Duke, um, and so on. So thank you very much, and any questions, uh, there's an email address.